Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, said these words, Behold, the Lamb of God, who has come to take away the sin of the world. This lovely song focuses our attention on the Lamb. All hail the Lamb. Let's praise God as we thank Him for His Son, the Lamb. Remember on Wednesday night it is our church night when we meet for praise and for the study of God's word and for prayer. And I would encourage you to take time and to make time to come along to our church night on Wednesday evening. Men, do keep in mind the men's fellowship on Tuesday the 20th of this month at half seven and Fred Greenfield is the special guest. Remember our two special evenings uh, this month, the 11th and the 18th. The 11th are carols by candlelight, and then on the 18th, our friends and family carol service. Leaflets have been distributed. I know you have been inviting and encouraging folk to come along and keep up that good work. And if you haven't made contact with any of them, well, why not do that this in coming week? Word of thanks again to those who worked so hard last Tuesday evening in the clean-up team. We appreciate your efforts and all you did on that evening. All the announcements that we make, we make them subject to the sovereign will of God. The God whom we worship, the God whom we praise tonight, is the God of all grace. And we sing this lovely song together. God of grace, amazing wonder irresistible and free. Let's stand as we praise God for his grace.
just take a moment of quietness and stillness in God's house as we bow in his presence in prayer. Every eye closed, every head bowed, as we recognize again tonight the tremendous privilege that the Lord has afforded to us in bringing us to this hour and to this house. Our Father and our God, we thank you for these words that we have been using to lift our hearts and our voices in praise. We thank you for the grace of God that has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ, God's well-beloved Son. And it's because of his love and mercy and goodness and grace that we can come with confidence to your throne tonight, none daring to make us afraid. We dare not, we must not, we cannot draw near through any merit of our own. We can only come to you tonight through the merit of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you again tonight for that new and living way that has been opened unto us through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we come tonight because it is possible to draw near because of the sufficiency of that work. We come tonight to ask for your help and for your blessing. We recognize your goodness and kindness to us in the journey of life. You are the God in whom we live and move and have our being. The very breath that we breathe has been given to us by yourself. We recognize tonight that every day we live, we experience the goodness and the kindness of our Creator. But we thank you tonight for everyone bowed before you who can rejoice because all their sins are forgiven and their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God is our Father, Jesus Christ our Savior, and the Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are your children. We praise you for the part of the day that is God, for help given and for any measure of blessing received. We pray that you will bless the word that has already been spoken from this pulpit, the word that was shared in our Sunday school and considered in the Bible class. And Lord, here we are. It's the evening of your day. And we remember how we read of two that walked the road to Emmaus long ago. And Luke tells us that it was getting toward evening and the day was far spent, for Jesus Christ himself drew near and went with them. May that be our experience tonight. May we know the living Lord Jesus drawing near and meeting with us. We thank you for an open door and access into this building tonight. We thank you for the comfort of this sanctuary. We pray for every church and every mission hall tonight whose pulpit is occupied by faithful servants of Jesus Christ, the living God. And as the good news of the gospel is proclaimed, oh, that hearts will be opened like the heart of Lydia long ago, and grace given to attend to the things spoken thereby. Lord, we just remember again the sick, the sad, and the lonely tonight. We pray again for this young girl that we've been praying for this morning and throughout this day. We ask, O oh God, that your hand will be upon her, that will please you to spur her life and to move by your spirit within the members of her family circle. Lord, often you touch the body in order to touch the soul. And may that be the experience of this little one and that family. Lord, we just look to you. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they live, but we've been asked to pray for them. We do that tonight, believing that our God hears and answers prayer and able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask with or think. Lord, shut us in with yourself. Remove from our minds every distracting, disturbing, and unnecessary thought. And above the many voices that are clamoring for attention, May we hear your voice tonight and respond to your truth in a way that shall be for our good and your eternal glory. And this we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. We continue to focus our attention on the grace of God and we sing these lovely words. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. Let's stand as we continue to praise God. <laughs> chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and we're going to read the first 10 verses of this 19th chapter of the gospel of Luke. This is the word of God. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see 
who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Sycamore, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and come down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He is going to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is the word of the Lord, and we give thanks to God for his word. They tell us that there are two signs to indicate that we're getting old. Listen carefully. One is that the snow is a nuisance, and the other is that the news has become our favorite television program. You may not agree with those telltale signs, but I think you'll agree with me when I say that today's news is not always good news. Not always heartwarming and uplifting. And from time to time there are certain aspects of the news that tend to affect us more than at other times. News items that grip our minds, stir our hearts, and evoke our sympathy. I think a little one missing from home is very much in that category. The question on everyone's lips is simply this, have they found him or her yet? Waiting for the news of a loved one who's gone missing is a dreaded experience and can cause endless pain and turmoil. To be in danger of being lost is a frightening experience. Have you ever seen that terrified look on a mother's face as she looked frantically on a crowded beach, a crowded beach for her little one who had gone missing. I was speaking to someone who was involved in a parents and toddlers group this week, and one little boy had gone missing. Of course, mom was enjoying coffee, speaking with other moms, and was unaware of it. And they searched frantically through the church. They were terrified until they opened the little door to the Sunday school room and there he was sitting enjoying a packet of crisps. The late president or the former president, President Roosevelt of the United States of America had a son who in the interest of anthropology went to Papua New Guinea, was lost and never found. Someone has said that being lost has a feeling all of its own. Geographically speaking, physically speaking, mentally speaking, we refer to people as being lost. We talk about being lost in a fog. We talk about being lost in a forest. We talk about being lost in a book. And we talk about being lost in a crowd. But in spite of all that I've said about the horrors and hazards of being lost, the Bible speaks to us about a state of lostness that is to be feared more than anything else in the world tonight. And that is being lost spiritually. Dr. Sidlow Baxter, in one of his many helpful books, says this, The word lost usually excites pity or alarm or grief. A lost child stirs us to deep concern. If we hear that a ship has been lost with all on board or that lives have been lost in a mining disaster, instantly we feel alarm and grief. Yet what are the greatest physical losses compared with a lost soul and a lost eternity? The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a church that met in a place called Ephesus. And in Ephesians chapter 2, He speaks of those who have no hope and are without God in the world. 
That's what it means to be lost. To have no hope and to be without God in this world. Here's a most terrifying condition to be in. To be at cross purposes with God's will. To be controlled by anyone or anything other than God. Such a condition is to be feared more than anything else in the world. And yet when you look out into our society tonight, you see such a condition reflected in the lifestyle of far too many men and women and young people who live for self and sin without any awareness of the danger that they are in. Many who think that freedom in life is not to be understood in terms of alcohol, drugs, immorality, power, pleasure, prestige, possession. These are the things that really matter. These are the things that make them tick. These are the things that get them out of bed in the morning. But the Bible says that such people are dead while they live. They are dead spiritually. They do not enjoy God's life. They do not have the enjoyment of eternal life that is found in Jesus Christ. They are lost. But the good news of the gospel is, is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come to seek and to save the lost. When you turn the pages of the Bible, you discover that he speaks about the lost sheep. He speaks about the lost silver. He speaks about the lost son. And the apostle Paul speaks about those who are lost. And the word that he uses is the word perishing. Perishing. It may be that maybe in other people's eyes you're doing well. You are envied. And they would never look upon you as someone who is lost and perishing. But God, but God tells us in his word... That every man, woman, boy or girl, young person outside of Jesus Christ is lost and perishing. Traveling on a broad road that is leading to destruction. Leading to a place the Bible calls hell. And we are in danger of allowing our thoughts about sin to be influenced by culture. Rather than by Christ. Our thought life can be controlled by the God of this world. Modern day living has subtly affected and shaped the thinking of far too many people. For many in our world tonight, the idea that the human race needs a savior sounds as something that is quaint. It would be unfair, of course, to imply that everybody in society is being brainwashed into believing that sin is something Victorian. Here and there, voices are being raised even among leading secularists who from time to time raise their voices and remind us that when society cuts the moral guidelines that hold us together, then we're heading for disaster. Let me read you something that I read from a very well-known American magazine called the Wall Street Journal. It reads as follows. The USA has a drug problem, an AIDS problem, a rape problem, a high school behavior problem. And none of this will go away until more people in positions of responsibility are willing to come forward and explain in frank moral terms that some of the things people do now are wrong. It is time that we got the word sin out of mothballs and began to use it again and understand what it means. Recent journalistic articles entitled Why Nothing is Wrong Anymore, Whatever Happened to Sin. Very few people come on the radio and say, the problem with humanity, the problem with our society, the problem with our culture, the problem with the breakdown and dysfunction of family life has nothing basically to do with housing or income. It has got to do with sin. People have turned their back on God and they're seeking to pursue a lifestyle and a life pattern 
that is divorced from the biblical narrative. And the good news of Jesus Christ tonight is this. In spite of man's depravity, in spite of man's disobedience, in spite of man's distance from God, the good news of Jesus Christ is that he, the Son of Man, has come to seek and to save the lost. Luke opens our eyes tonight to the Master's mission. And I have a simple one-word question that I would like you to consider tonight. Why? Why? Why should the Son of Man come to seek and to save the lost? That's a good question. After all, man is not lost by accident, but by a deliberate choice. He chose what he wanted to do. I'll rule okay. Summed up the attitude of his heart and mind way back in the Garden of Eden. Had Frank Sinatra been around, then his song would have been a very favorite song, I Did It My Way. And at the dawn of creation, he believed the devil's lie, and in the spirit of defiance, he turned his back on God, and the rest is history. But every generation has lived to witness the cruel consequences of that sinful choice. And from Adam's rebellion in the Garden of Eden, there's emerged a rebellious mindset that has weaved its way into our behavior problem, which can be summarized in these words, not God's way, but my way. And it's an all-inclusive description. Isaiah hit the nail on the head, didn't he, in Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. All of us have turned everyone to his own way. You see, man does not steal by accident. He doesn't cheat by accident. He doesn't swear and take the Lord's name in vain by accident. He doesn't swindle and deceive by accident. All this is the evidence of a sinful nature within. Why then should God bother with people like that? Why did Jesus come into the world? Why did he get involved? There was an awful tragedy that took place downtown New York many years ago. And many people saw what happened. But very few people did anything about it. And when they were questioned as to why, in an anonymous manner, many people wrote in, and the common response was this, I didn't want to get involved. I didn't want to get involved. We would not be here this evening. This meeting would not be convened. This message would not be preached tonight had Jesus Christ himself not got involved. Why? Why? Well, I think as we unpack the story of Zacchaeus tonight, there are three simple answers to that question. The first is this. Because we are precious to God. Because we are precious to God. You see, historically, Jericho was a very important city. But far more important to the Savior in the city was a citizen in that city. If you know anything about the background of Jericho, you know that Herod the Great built his famous winter palace with its ornamental gardens and palm springs and balsam groves in Jericho. Jericho was a flourishing business town in its day. And the popular phrase was, all roads led to Jericho. But here in Luke chapter 19, we see that the Lord Jesus comes to Jericho because he's more interested in people than places. And in Jericho, there was a man more precious to the Lord than all the world's fine gold. Why? Well, like all men, he was created in the image of God. That simply means he was made by God for God. He was made to live in harmony with God. He was made to live in harmony with God and experience the companionship, help, and friendship 
of God in a lifestyle that would be glorifying and pleasing to God his maker. He was created to enjoy a unique relationship known only to men and women. I believe in angels. The Bible has much to teach us about angels. Angels in heaven tonight do what God tells them to do, but they can never know the relationship between God and his children. And people may say that nobody cares. But we can say upon the authority of the word of God, and those of us who have experienced the grace of God, that God cares. And he cares about our greatest need. Too many of man's problems tonight result from their greed, not their need. Jesus has come to seek and to save the lost because we are precious to him. Didn't the Lord Jesus Christ declare, what shall it profit a man if we were to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's how precious the soul of a man or a woman or a young person is to the Almighty. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost tonight. Why? Because we are precious to God. You are precious to God tonight. For God has made you in his image. He has put eternity within your heart tonight. You are an eternal being. You shall never die. You will die physically, but you shall live on in eternity. Where you live in eternity will be determined by what you do with Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. You are precious to God tonight. Secondly, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost because we have a potential for God. We have a potential for God. Look at this man, Zacchaeus. History tells us that he was the leading tax official in Jericho. Now, tax officials are not popular sometimes. But this man was not popular at any time. Why? Because he abused his position to feather his own nest. To line his own pocket. He was a Jew. And the Romans, who were in power demanded taxes of the Jewish people. And this man, Zacchaeus, robbed his own people by serving his own interests as well as being a tax collector for the ruling powers. His name was despicable. It was a dirty word. But it's to this man that Jesus came. Why? Because of what the Apostle Paul speaks about in his letter to the Romans, where he says, We're sin abound. Grace doth much more abide. But when you note the detail that the beloved physician, Dr. Luke, draws our attention to, the Lord Jesus calls this man by name, Zacchaeus. He says, make haste or hurry up from down. This is a matter of urgency. The Zacchaeus, you have served the devil long enough. Now you're going to serve me. Let's pause tonight and Raise this question. Who are you serving? How do you relate to these things? Where is Jesus Christ tonight in your life? You see, your life is either under his control, and as a result, you are at peace with God through his son, the Lord Jesus. Or else you are being deceived by the devil and are under his control. The God of this world, who has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of God. It's vitally important, is it not, that our lives are in the right hands. A steering wheel in a car in the wrong hands spells danger. A needle in the wrong hand can inflict pain. A knife in the wrong hand can bring grief. Who's at the helm of your life tonight? Who is the captain of your life tonight? What chart 
and compass guides you through life. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He has come to seek and to save fallen mankind tonight because we are precious to God. Because we have a potential for God. And thirdly, because of a price that was payable only by God. It cost God the Father to send his one and only Son into the world. It cost Jesus to come into this world, for in coming he knew what lay ahead of him in order that sinners like you and I might be saved. He knew the price that would have to be paid in order that those who were lost might be found. There was no reason for Jesus to die the death he died, but he died that death. Why? Why was the innocent Son of God kneeled to the cross to be forsaken by God and man? For the Bible declared, Cursed is every one that hangs on a tree. The answer to that question tonight is that he did it for you and he did it for me. He took the punishment due to others so that others might be delivered from it. He had nothing to die for. He was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God who knew no sin, did no sin, was guilty of no sinful action or no sinful reaction. No sinful thought ever tainted his pure and undefiled mind. But what we deserve, he took upon himself. He became our substitute. That is what happened at Calvary. And this is the unmistakable teaching of the sacred scriptures. This is not some speculation or some vain imagination. This is the clear revelation found in God's word, the Bible. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. He died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good. That we at last might go to heaven saved by his precious blood. What theological truth is contained in Mrs. Alexander's lovely hymn, There is a Green Hill Far Away. And through the cross, God showed his loving kindness and favor to poor lost sinners. But there are many tonight who reject the cross. There are many tonight who neglect the cross. There are many tonight who bypass the cross. And in their rejection and in their neglect and in their bypassing of the cross, they emphasize the lyrics of that song. I did it my way. Sometimes we say to ourselves that we couldn't live if we knew what lay ahead of us. The eternal Son of God knew from the earliest days of his life on earth that he must be about his father's business. That's what he said among the scribes and the learned people in Jerusalem when Mary, his earthly mother, found him. Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? And he knew that ultimately his father's business would not only involve him in teaching parables and performing miracles, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, and raising the dead, and revealing the word and the will of God to a listening congregation. But the will of the Father would bring him to a place called Calvary, where he would bleed and die in agony and shame. You see, to bypass the cross tonight is to undermine the holiness of God. It is to fail to understand how pure and how holy God is tonight. As we gather here tonight, there are all sinning angels 
who cover their faces and assemble around the throne of God in heaven and they cry, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord. To be indifferent to the cross is to undermine and underestimate the love of God. The only one who can deal with sin has dealt with it and comes now as he came to Zacchaeus and he calls you by name tonight. He knows you. He knows just where you are. And he knows where you stand in relation to his son, Jesus Christ. Stop fooling yourself. Stop thinking that you're a Christian because you know the hymns and you know certain verses in the Bible, but you've never bowed humbly at the foot of the cross and said, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. I want your salvation. I want you to come into my life and I want you to change the way I live. Can you sing tonight what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart? There's a desire for his word. There's a desire for his will. There's a desire for his ways. He calls you by name. He knows where you are tonight. He knows where you stand. He knows whether you need to say, I'm lost. And I need you to come. I can remember it well in a park in Bournemouth. We were playing with the children and there's always one in the family who wanders, and one of them wandered. And of course I watched him, and he just wandered right through the gates to another area. He went up the old slide, and he was up the slide, and the gate was locked, and he, I knew he wouldn't know the way back. And I said to the attendant, I said, you see that little boy at the top of the gate? That's my son. He's lost, but he doesn't know he's lost. Would you turn him in my direction? And he turned him in my direction and he waved and I waved and thankfully he came running to where I was. He didn't realize he was lost. I wonder tonight, do you realize that you're lost? That you've never come to Jesus? That you're only playing around with this? That you've made a profession but there's no possession? There's no hunger and thirst for God? This is serious. Very serious. And so he comes and he calls you and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. For today I must abide in your house. Maybe tonight you're saying I'm too bad. No, you're not. For the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a part of the seas. Maybe you're saying I'm too late. No, you're not. For now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. You see, the wonderful truth of the grace of God tonight is that there are none too bad that they can't be saved. That there are none too good that they don't need to be saved. Here's a very interesting thing when you read this story. Society referred to him as a tax collector. But Jesus saw him as a sinner was a sinner. The story of the Titanic has been referred to many times. And I don't know whether you know this story, but in the Liverpool Star, there was a newspaper shop, and on the outside of the shop there were two billboards. And on one billboard was the word saved, and the names of those who were saved. And the other, lost and the names of those who were known to be lost. Saved or lost. God's book tonight is not Catholic or Protestant. It's not Republican or Loyalist. It's not Orange or Hibernian. It's not color, class or creed tonight. You're either saved or you're either lost. You're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. You see, society saw him as a tax collector. The Pharisees saw him as a sinner. The Savior saw him 
as someone who was lost. And if you read the story again, it was his first opportunity. I wonder, did his curiosity bring him? But you notice, it was not only his first opportunity, it was also his last opportunity. Why do I say that? Because if you read the narrative, you learn that Jesus would never pass that way again. Jesus entered, says Luke, and passed through Jericho. It reminds me of the old hymn, Jesus is passing this way today. Oh, my friends, God only knows. You see, in 1912, the great ocean liner Titanic struck an iceberg on the North Atlantic sank. Some were saved, the majority were lost. There was no in between. We sing that little chorus in the hearing of our boys and girls, I was lost, but Jesus found me. Found the sheep that went astray. Now I am his very own, and I live for him alone, ever seeking other lives to win. The Son of Man has come. We're celebrating his coming into the world. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Why? Because we are precious to God. Because we have a potential for God. Because of a price that was only payable by God. Tonight, what is it? Lost or found? In or out? The broad road or the narrow road. What you do with Christ tonight will determine your destiny for all eternity. Let's pray. Let's take a moment just of quiet reflection. No restlessness, just quietly bowing our heads, reflecting upon these truths as we think tonight of the words of the Lord Jesus, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Father, we thank you for the good news that these words bring to our hearts tonight. We thank you that Jesus is still seeking the lost. And we thank you that his sacrifice on the cross is sufficient to bring all who trust in him out of darkness into light, out of a place of no hope and despair into a place of great joy and delight. We pray that that may be the happy and blessed experience of every head bowed before you. Lord, we can hide nothing from you. You know each and every one of us. Help us tonight to realize that there's a way back to God from the dark path of sin. The door has been opened and we may go in and Calvary's cross is where we begin. We come as sinners to Jesus. And if we have never come, oh God, help us to realize tonight the seriousness of not coming. Help us to appreciate tonight, tonight the necessity of coming just as we are. Just now. We thank you that if we come believing, we will leave receiving. And it will be the greatest day of our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, my Savior, to Bethlehem came. Here's a lovely song, well-known song. We'll conclude the meeting by singing. Thank you.
shall see him descend from the sky. He's coming. We might never see Christmas Day. He's coming in a moment in the twinkling of an eye the trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ will be raised first and we who are alive and remain under the Lord's and his coming shall be caught up and together we shall meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. If you haven't come tonight, it'll be too late there. Think carefully, soberly about these things. Don't hesitate. Just this evening. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. And we pray that these truths tonight will not be lost in conversation. But as we leave this sanctuary tonight, they will resonate with us and rest deeply in all our hearts tonight. We thank you tonight. Those of us who know the Savior, we thank you tonight. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Had that not been so, we would not be here this evening. So part is in your fear and with your favor through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's people said, Amen. Amen.